Hi guys, Ricky Pope here, and this week on the Christian Nerd Unite podcast, I'm joined by comic artist Al Nickerson, former inker for Marvel and DC, and we talk about his graphic novel, The Sword of Eden, plus scripture and nerdy news, and we'll get to all of that right after this. I love sharing Jesus and my nerdiness with you every week. As you know, we are part of the Christian Nerd HQ podcast network, and we recently launched a new show called The Bible Nerd Show. Here's a quick word from David about the show. Hey, nerds, this is David. You know me best from Tatooine Sons, but I want to introduce to you a new show coming to the Christian Nerd HQ. It's called The Bible Nerd Show. This is where the a preacher a teacher and an average joe all come together on a weekly basis to look at the blockbuster television series called the chosen each week we take a deeper look into it episode by episode as we uncover some of the best moments within the show uh some of the biblical uh stories within it and identify whether or not we agree with the choices that they made biblically and we look at the historic geographic religious and cultural context of each episode it is a lot of fun we can't wait for you to check it out it comes out on every Thursdays here on the Christian Nerd HQ. Make sure you check out the Bible Nerd Show. Make sure you check out the Bible Nerd Show and all the other great podcasts at ChristianNerdHQ.com. Now let's read some scripture. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I love this passage, and since this is the first day of the new year, I thought I would read it. Many will choose today to start reading through the Bible. If you've not done that before, or if you haven't done it in a long time, I encourage you to try. If you're not sure where to begin, I recommend starting with the book of John. It's also a great place for new believers to begin. Uh, There's a lot of great Bible apps as well with yearly reading plans, or if you need to, you can go to christiannerdsunite.com slash Bible to download a simple PDF with a reading plan for the year. Go check it out. Now for some nerdy news. This weekend at the box office closed out 2023. Wonka takes first place with $23 million domestically. The film is doing well, and with over $387 million worldwide so far, will more than likely pay back its production costs and marketing. Aquaman The Lost Kingdom comes in second, adding $19 million domestically this weekend, with a current domestic total of only $84 million and a worldwide total of only $285 million dollars, This film is really struggling and probably won't be able to make back that whole budget. Uh, Animated film Migration comes in third at $17 million domestically. The new release The Color Purple, a movie musical based on the stage musical and the 1982 novel, come in fourth with $13 million domestically. And romantic comedy Anyone But You rounds out the top five with $9 million domestically. Looking at pre-pandemic annual box office numbers, 2023 ends the year just a little better than 2005 numbers. I expect it to take a couple more years until the box office can be back up to the 2019 totals, if they were ever able to get there even. Um, The Hollywood Reporter is saying that because of the recent strikes causing films to be delayed and many films moving from 2024 back to 2025, 
it's possible that 2024 will not even be as high as 2023 was. We'll have to wait and see. Warner Brothers Discovery is in talks for a possible merger with Paramount. This could include the Max streaming service combining with Paramount+. Plus. Talks are just beginning, and it's unclear if Warner Brothers Discovery is interested in just Paramount or if they're interested in the parent company, National Amusements. A source says in an Axios report that both options are on the table. In our interview today, we talk with Al Nickerson about his journey to becoming a comic artist and how his faith has impacted his art. Let's get right into our interview. Al Nickerson, it is great having you on the Christian Nerds Unite podcast today. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. So, um, Al, for those who, who aren't familiar with you, I mean, you are a, a, a comic artist. And but for those who might not be familiar with some of your work, want to tell us a little bit about who Al Nickerson is. Um, well, currently I'm self-publishing a Christian graphic novel series called The Sword of Eden. So the first volume is already on sale. Um, but I started working in comics in 1994. I worked for Warp Graphics, uh, Marvel. I spent about eight and a half years working for DC Comics. At the same time, I was working for Archie Comics, and that was eight years for Archie. I was an animator at MTV Animation, Nickelodeon, Sesame Street. I was a designer on the Ace Ventura Pet Detective series. I've self-published other material. I worked on a lot of other creator-owned work with other publishers. So now, yeah, it's just the Sword of Eden, working on that, working on Volume 2, selling artwork. Uh, yeah, just keeping busy. Very cool. So what got you into to comic art? Um, well, when I was younger, like most children, I liked to draw. Uh, most kids I find like to draw when they're young. And, and at some point they stopped drawing. And uh, my parents were very supportive of me uh, with drawing and they would buy me art supplies and stuff. And they were very supportive of me uh, reading comic books and watching cartoons. So, uh, yeah, I loved all that stuff. And I never sort of grew out of it, you know. Um, so I think when I was probably like 12 or 13 years old, I realized I wanted to actually have a career working in comics. And I wanted to work for Marvel. And when I was in high school, I realized I wanted to be a uh, comic book inker. And there were mm -hmm. guys who were inkers like Terry Austin or Gene Day. And uh, I had noticed all the work that they had done looked better than everybody else's work. And I got really uh, attracted to uh, comic book inking. And Terry, Terry Austin's ink line, the very sort of sick, uh, slick line, uh, yeah, it was gorgeous. So that's what I wanted to do. And I graduated high school and I uh, attended the School of Visual Arts and graduated uh, from SVA in four years and had some great teachers. And then I was a graphic de designer for a few years. And then I started working for uh, Warp Graphics. And that was my first um, paying comic book gig, working on ElfQuest um, Blood of Ten Chiefs. Oh, wow. So you, know, you mentioned that you're an inker. Um, for those who aren't super familiar with the differentiation, what does an inker do versus, say, the the person who says they're the the artist of the comic or uh, the colorer? What does the inker do? Well, back in those days, when you drew pen and ink on paper, usually you like you know at Marvel or DC or Archie, uh, the more uh, corporate owned comp uh, publishers, they would have one artist like draw a page in pencil. And an inker would go over it in ink and usually uh, using a brush or a nib. And they would add all the line weight and, and uh, tighten up all the artwork and add on all the shadows and the shading and that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, I really loved doing that at the time. But, yeah, with the Sword of Eden, it's all me. It's, you know, writing it and drawing it and penciling and inking and doing the lettering and, and all that fun stuff. Very cool. Well, you mentioned going to, to an art school. Uh, what was that like? And do you, did that uh, really push you ahead to, uh, to, to do more? It was uh, life-changing really. Um, 
you know, being in high school, I, you know, grew up in a very rural area and I wanted to move on, you know. So when I had the opportunity to go to SVA, yeah, it was New York City, staying at the dorm, um, having some great teachers. And, uh, you know, the first year is hard, hardcore. You know, I had a, like a six hour drawing class, a six hour painting class, six hour mm -hmm. sculpture class. And it was half art and half academic. Okay. And um, my second year, I had teachers like Will Eisner and Sal Amendola and Gene Colan and Harvey Kurtzman and Erwin Hasen and, and Bert Hasen, his cousin, as a pa uh, painting teacher. And learning from those guys was absolutely phenomenal. So you really learned uh, the trade in regards to how to, uh, you know, create comics and laying out a page and, you know, writing and drawing comics and doing lettering and inking and all that great stuff. And these, these guys were amazing. The weird thing, though, is that when you're younger, or at least in my case, you don't appreciate it as much as you probably should. <laughs> and I kind of like look back at it and I'm like, I wish I had lect I had recorded like all these guys lectures, you know, mm. uh, you know, because now most of them, you know, they're gone. And uh, yeah, I think I, I would have appreciated I should have appreciated, you know, having those teachers more uh, at that time. Not that I didn't. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, mm -hmm. looking back at it now and thinking, you know, like Will Eisner was my teacher for four years or three years. I mean, that's just, it's amazing. But at the time it was just Will, you know, Will Eisner. So. Yeah. So, you know, learning from somebody like Will Eisner, what do you think there's, what do you think there's the one thing that you, you took away from that, that you, you still use today? Well, there's a lot of things I learned from Will Eisner that, um, really impacted me. One of the things was that he had, I, I don't think I ever met anyone else working in comics who was so optimistic about the medium. Hmm. Um, and he was always looking at looking forward. He was always looking ahead and he took, um, well, he, he referred to comics as sequential art, the, the, you know, comics uh, themselves, mm -hmm. the art of making comics as sequential art. So he had a, a very strong um, value on sequential art and he took it quite seriously and he thought comic books um, should be read by everyone and it was and he believed that comics was a very important and powerful art form uh, and form of literature. Um, and he one of the first quotes he said in class and I, I repeat this story all the time, but he's said this a lot uh, in interviews too, but he said that, he thought that comics were more than two mutants trashing each other. And uh, that was really impressive, you know, because at the time you know, I wanted to work for Marvel and hmm. realizing how he felt about superheroes and that sort of thing. And me realizing that comic books could be more than just superheroes. That was very powerful. But his thing was just really about um, laying out a page, telling a story and making sure all the elements of, of on the page actually work together. So it's, you know, um, when you compose a page, a page um, you should uh, consider the word balloons and all the lettering when you're composing the page and how they, the artwork mm -hmm. illustration should work with the word balloons. They should work together. It's lettering, he mm -hmm. believed, and word uh, balloons should not just be something you would slap down like at the end and just try to force it into the page. It should be part of um, the art of putting together a page and composing your page. So you got to think about those things. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, you've, you've done you know, work for some of the big corporate names in comics and you've done work for yourself. Um, what was it like working for some of those, those big comic companies? Well, that at, at the time, for the most part, it was wonderful because it's really what I wanted to do. And, you know, I think it was a blessing you know, being able to work for Marvel and, you know, DC and Archie and, you know, uh, work graphics. So at the time, yeah, it was great. You know, it was better than digging ditches. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I enjoyed, and I enjoyed inking, you know, and working with a lot of great people. And, you know, for the most part, I was treated pretty well. I think so. Yeah, it was great. It was, but also at the same time, I was doing some creator owned work, um, and self publishing and doing web comics and stuff. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, I find more jo joy doing that. But yeah, to pay the bills and working in comics, yeah, uh, at the time it was great. 
And and now that you're, you know, you're kind of in charge of your own destiny there. Um, what is the self-published comic book world like? Well, the thing, and this is one of the things I would tell my students and what I actually saw in uh, my students, a lot of artists just want to draw. Like they're not really concerned that much with the business side of mm -hmm. art and they probably don't put a lot of thought in it. So if you want to self publish, you really have to understand the business side of things. You got to understand mm. how to deal with printers and distributors and now even retailers. So you got to really understand the business side of things and you got to like it, you know? So if you want to be successful self publishing and working in comics, you get really got to understand and like the business side of things. Like some guys just want to draw. And if you make mm. your whole career just drawing stuff, then that's fine. Just be careful of the, uh, contracts you sign. And that's another thing. Cause like I was never taught anything about contracts when I was in school. So I learned mm -hmm. all that stuff when I was actually working in comics. So you got to be very careful about what you're signing, what you're signing away. And, uh, yeah. So, but yeah, but a lot of artists, they don't think about business. They don't care about business, but if you want to self publish, you got to really understand that and, and enjoy it. Well, uh, you know, moving into that self-published world, uh, I've had some other uh, comic artists on the show before. Um, I had um, Ronald from uh, um, Silverline recently, and uh, you know, he talked a lot about the, you know the process of going into self-publishing. Now, are you are you funding all your own self-publishing, or are you doing? Uh, crowdfunding for your publishing? How, how are you making all that happen? I haven't done any crowdfunding yet, although recently I've been really considering it. So for volume two of The Sword of Eden, I might have to do some crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another thing. Like Everything is a lot more expensive now, so printing bills are insane. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I got to look into that. And I know a few guys that do crowdfunding in comics, so maybe I'll talk to them, see how that works, whether it you know, if I need to have like two crowdfunding platforms, whether to do like Indiegogo and, you know, fund my comic at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. But I've never done it before, so I kind of have to ask around, but we'll see. Very cool. Well, talk to us a little bit about the Sword of Eden. That's your, your current project. Um, where did that all come from? How did that all come to be? Uh, that's a good question. Um, some of the characters actually have been in print prior to the Sword of Eden graphic novel. Okay. Um, mostly, I was very tired of working in uh, secular comics, and I realized that my career in comics and animation has been a blessing, and I wanted to give back to God. And I do believe that comics mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is a very powerful art form and a very powerful literary form that should be delving into very important stories and very powerful messaging. So there's mm -hmm. nothing more important than the gospel message. So I wanted to create content that actually had the gospel in there. And I wanted to create content that Christians could read and not mm -hmm. feel like they're compromising the principles. Cause a lot of the entertainment we see nowadays in comics and film and television, is very ungodly. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to create something that a Christian could read and enjoy it and not feel like they're being insulted or compromising Christian principles. And I love superheroes. So I wanted to create, so I wanted to put all that stuff together. So I created a, a new character who's kind of like initially, you know, the lead character in the story. Um, and we follow her as she starts her first day as a superhero. Uh, her name is <laughs> Rebecca Stern. And it, the Sword of Eden graphic novel is 220 pages. It's black and white. It's recommended for preteens and older. So there's some like superhero violence in there. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and you can purchase it on Amazon or eBay or go to my website, uh, the sort of And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, and I've been selling directly to readers. I've been selling directly to uh, comic book stores. Uh, Christianbook.com was selling it and they sold out. And then oh, wow. uh, Diamond was distributing the book as well to comic book stores. So, and then the book is being sold in the UK and Rome, uh, as well as Austria. I had readers in the Philippines buy copies. Uh, a guy in Romania bought copies. 
So yeah, it's 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 all over the place now, which is wonderful. So, so and how? I, oh, go so, ahead. Oh yeah, well the book is you know it's in comic book stores and regular bookstores and Christian bookstores and yeah it's wonderful and dealing directly with readers uh, is wonderful. So you got to do all that kind of stuff if you, if you want to get your book out there. So you you mentioned you know being a believer and uh, you know not not wanting to having some issues with some of the the secular work that you were uh, doing previously. Um, how has your faith really informed your artwork over the years? Well, the story content, the Sword of Eden is very Christian. It has very strong Christian themes in it. And, uh, yeah, I, I share the gospel message in the work as well. Um, I tend to find more secular entertainment to be very empty. So, um, and things weren't quite as woke as they are now when I was actually working for like Marvel and DC and Archie. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when I started working for Archie, the first book they gave me was Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And back then it was kind of innocent. You know, it wasn't like how, mm -hmm. you know, if you're aware of the Sabrina the Teenage Witch uh, Net Netflix show, right. how that was really like quite terrible. So it wasn't like that back then. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to work on something that was Christian, something that was given back to God, something that has something very par powerful and important to say and create stuff for Christians. So that's kind of my motivating factor in that. And I love superheroes, so I wanted to work in that genre. And there's some stories that I wanted to tell, um, one of which was uh, there's a character called the Green Knight from Arthurian uh, literature. Mm -hmm. And I kind yeah. of wonder, whatever happened to that guy? You know, So I was able to tell that story. Like, what happened to that guy? You know, so I did that. And yeah, so the Sword of Eden graphic novel, I think it's got like three stories in it, three main stories, uh, featuring the same characters as they move along. But uh, yeah, but the Vine 2 is just one story where our heroes are fighting uh, a bunch of ninja. So uh, <laughs> so that's Vine 2. So that's what I'm finishing up now. Very cool. Uh, well, you did go into to self-publishing. Um, what made you decide to go the self-published route versus trying to join in with um, one of the other existing Christian comic book production houses? Well, I contacted a, a few. There was a time where I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go with this. Um, I had self-published a couple of comics prior to the Sword of Eden with some friends of mine. And <clears throat> I was also a big fan of Cerebus by Dave Sim. Mm -hmm. Yep. Dave has been very outspoken about self-publishing, and if anybody is interested in self-publishing, you should get a copy of the uh, Service Guide to Self-Publishing. Dave explains everything in it, and it's amazing. And I was a huge fan of Dave's, Dave's work since I started college. Yeah. So there were a couple of publishers that were interested. I didn't like the deal that they were offering me. Um, there mm. were a couple of Christian book publishers that just didn't weren't they were not in, interested in doing superhero stuff. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I figured, well, I'll just self-publish it. And, you know, self-publishing, I don't have to worry about an editor. I've dealt with editors before at all the other mm -hmm. publishers I've worked with. And I didn't really want to deal with someone telling me how to write and draw my own stories with my own characters in them. So self-publishing, working on creator own work gives you that opportunity. So, yeah, that seemed to be the only, only option. And I, I prefer it, you know. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, even at like Christian publishers, yeah, they just weren't interested in doing superhero stuff is mostly doing like Bible stories, which is fine. You know, mm -hmm. um, they're great at doing that, but that's not what I wanted to do. Gotcha. Well, when you were, um, you mentioned earlier, uh, you mentioned, uh, that you did some teaching. So you, you taught, um, sequential art for about 10 years. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. How did that come to be? What was that like? Um, well, it started with um, my really wanting to teach comics, to teach sequential art, because it's a medium that I love mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as, a, as a reader and, and, and a, as a, uh, a, a creator. And I wanted to teach young people about comics and how to draw comics. And, Mm -hmm. I was pestering a local uh, college, uh, SUNY Orange. Uh, they're part of the SUNY um, schools in the state of New York, uh, the mm -hmm. SUNY University of New York. 
Okay. So I was pestering them for many years because they didn't have a class like this. Mm. So it took, I think, like six or eight years before they decided that they would actually run my class. Sequential, it's called Sequential Art Comics Illustration. I, I wanted to call it Sequential Art only uh, based on Will Eisner's class uh, at SVA, which was called Sequential Art. But the college was like, well, you know, you just can't call it sequential art because no one's going to know what it means. I'm like, you're a mm. college, you know, you should, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to compromise. So it ended up being called sequential art colon comics illustration. And it, it was not a requirement. All the students that took the class loved taking the class. They wanted to work in, either in comics or animation. And it was a great, mm. great fun. So work, being in the classroom was wonderful. And I could talk about, you know, how to actually draw comics. Uh, I talked about self-publishing creators' rights. I talked about contracts. I talked about storyboards. So the students would draw a four-page comic book story, and then they would draw some daily comic strips. So yeah, being in a classroom was a lot of fun. And since I created the class, I didn't have a whole lot of interference about what I was teaching in the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, which was great. But it's uh, SUNY Orange is also a very liberal school, and uh, eventually they did not take kindly uh, to the idea of having a teacher who is a Christian uh, teaching mm -hmm. one of their classes. So they're not very inclusive. They're not very tolerant. And a lot of these kids coming in are really messed up because they're told like a lot of crazy stuff. And young people, you know, if they think, if they like a teacher and a teacher tells them a lot of crazy nonsense, they think, well, the teacher's got to be correct and telling the truth because they're a teacher. <coughs> but that's not always the case. So we talk about history and politics and you know i had one student asked me um if i she had wondered if i thought that if pokemon was satanic or not so we got in this whole conversation about christianity and and my mm. thoughts and beliefs and it was like it was wonderful and they, for the most part they were very open-minded about that and it was great i love that it was it was a lot of fun and teaching was a lot of fun and uh you know i taught that i taught intro to art and i taught a uh, design two class as well very cool. Well, you you've had quite the uh, quite the adventure over the years in comics. What is uh, you mentioned uh, that Sword of Eden is going to have a a second book? Um, do you have any other big projects in the works? Is there anything that you're looking at for the future? Um, well, uh, just a sort of Eden. So volume two, I, uh, most of the line work is done. So I'm adding all the great okay. tones and doing all the lettering now, which is very time consuming. And I started drawing volume three. So I'm working on that as well. And I got like the first four books planned out and I'm doing some prints. I do limited edition summer, uh, signed and numbered prints. So I include those whenever, um, readers buy the sort of Eden directly from me. So I add a whole bunch of extra signed goodies in there and, you know, they love that and that's wonderful. So yeah, that keeps me busy and it's great. Very cool. Now, um, you, you started out, you mentioned, you know, the, the pencils on paper and inking. And I know a lot of comic creators now, uh, everything's digital. When you're working on sort of Eden, are you doing, are you doing more of the digital artwork style or are you trying to do it more traditionally? I still like drawing on paper. So what I do is I'll um, actually, I got something here. So yeah, so I still draw, you know, pen and ink on paper. So this is actually the first page of volume three. I was working okay. on. Um, so I still like, doing pen and ink on paper. And then I would scan this in and I would do all my gray tones and coloring and all my lettering in Photoshop. So it's both, it's, you know, more okay. you know, traditional and then, um, working in Photoshop. So yeah, doing lettering in Photoshop is wonderful. Uh, it's easy to fix any mistakes and, uh, doing my coloring in Photoshop is wonderful. Uh, and then formatting the pages for the printer, you know, it's all done in Photoshop. But yeah, I, I still like um, using the, a pen and a nib on paper and getting that really slick sort of like uh, line weight to my work. Um, I don't think mm. you can really, well, just yet, I don't think you can really um, copy that doing it digitally. 
if somebody wanted to get into comic book artwork today, mm. where would you tell them to start? Um, well, there's a bunch of books I like. Um, I could recommend that. Um, Will Eisner's Comics and Sequential Art, uh, which was mandatory read in Will's class. You know, <laughs> there's that. Imagine uh, that. <laughs> it is. Comic Cloud has written three books on comics. One is called Making Comics, which is really good. There's another book called uh, Panel Discussions, and that was published by Tomorrow's, and I would recommend that. Ultimately, I would recommend whatever work you want to do, make sure it's it's created by people who actually work in the field. Mm. So those three books I, I highly recommend in regards to uh, making comics. And go to a good school if you can afford it, um, or and or get an internship somewhere. So the School mm. of Visual Arts is great. Uh, SCAD, the Savannah College of Art Des and Design is great. Um, uh, what's it called? The Cartoon Studies. Oh, I can't remember the name of the school. Up in Vermont. Um, they have a very good uh, comics program. So those three schools I would recommend, if you can afford doing that. Mm. Well, um, I'm sure there are some aspiring artists out there. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, you, you do it all. You're, you're writing the story, you're doing the artwork and you're, um, assembling it and you're the publisher. Um, talk to me about making that leap from, I'm an artist to, I am the writer of the story. I think, um, if you want to be the writer of the story, you really have something, you really have to want to have something to say. You, you want, it's not just telling a story, but you, you're trying to say something. And there are some artists that really, they just want to draw, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so they might not have something to say, but if you have something to say, uh, using the medium of comics is a wonderful way to sort of tell whatever it is you want to tell. And again, even when I was working for DC and Archie, you know, I was doing stuff on the side that was, you know, creator own work and, and uh, yeah, I had my own stories I want to tell, and I worked with other comic book creators, and we had team ups, and we did stuff like that where our characters would, you know, meet. And uh, yeah, it's fun. So yeah, you gotta have something to say, and so say it. And comics again is a very powerful literary form, powerful art form, and uh, yeah, it's a great way to. I don't want to say express yourself because it's kind of hippy dippy and you know, <laughs> doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. But yeah, if you have a story you want to tell tell it. If you have something to say, say it, you know, and using comics is a great way of doing that. And, and all you need is one person. It's not like an animation or film or even music in some sense where you just got to have a lot of people working with you in comics. Mm -hmm. You just need a piece of paper, a pen and you, and yeah, you can just start working from there. Now you did mention working with uh, uh, comic stores earlier. Uh, a lot of comic shops are, are struggling right now. Uh, I have a friend in, in just south, the town just south of me who owns a comic book shop. Um, and, uh, you know, they're always looking for ways to get people in the door. Um, what is it like working directly with comic shops? And, you know, is that, do you see that as something that is, still going strong or do you see it as something that's may not be with us much longer? You know, it's interesting because a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I hope I got his name right. Phil Boyle. He owns a chain of comic book stores in Florida called uh, Coliseum of comics. And he wrote a letter about, you know, the state of things in the comic book direct market. Um, and some people got a little annoyed with some of the things he had to say. Um, he was saying initially, well, essentially that, comic book stores won't be around in two years. And he gave the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And he also gave some ways of fixing that problem. So I reached out to him just to let him know, you know, I like what you had to say. It's great. You know, if you're interested in working with me, I'd be happy to, you know, sell you some books. And he bought mm -hmm. uh, 10 copies of the Sword of Eden. <clears throat> so he has uh, 11 stores down in Florida. And uh, I added some stuff. So I gave him like, <laughs> 10 signed prints numbered in prints to help as a, some sort of incentive uh, for readers. Mm -hmm. And I think I put nine copy, nine comics in there that I did for like Marvel and 
maybe not Marvel, but Archie and DC. And I signed those and I put it in the box as well to kind of help him out too. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm very appreciative of that. And um, also there's a Christian bookstore in New England called Morningstar. And they have like six or seven stores up in like Massachusetts and Connecticut. Yeah, Morningstar bookstore. So they have copies of the Sword of Eden as well. And there's a local um, comic book store by me, uh, Haven for Heroes. And they bought a few copies. And uh, they're selling those. I think they only have a couple copies left. Uh, and a couple other local stores as well, bookstores. So, yeah, uh, working with retailers is great. It's 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 wonderful. Um, so, you know, I'm very appreciative of that. The kind of stuff that Marvel and DC are publishing now, which doesn't seem to be selling very well. And it's really affecting comic book stores now. Mm. So that's one of the things that I, I like to do <clears throat> is uh, to work directly with comic book stores. And I've had some very good success with that. Mm. Um, uh, Cause a lot of these stores are struggling because they can't sell a lot of this Marvel and DC stuff. So if they purchase mm. the books directly from me, um, they get more of a cut. I get more of a cut because there's no distributor. I'm the dis- distributor. So yeah. I'm the books directly to them. And that's been, that's been wonderful too. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's great. And especially now with the internet and everything else and crowdfunding, like you said, and YouTube and self publishing. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no reason why you can't just do your own stuff and get it out there and then not have to worry about gatekeepers or distributors or middlemen or anything like that, or people approving of, of your work. So yeah, if you want to do anything, whether it's art or music or writing prose or, you know, just do it, just, just do the work first. And then, you know, again, you would have to understand the business side of things, but yeah, there's nothing that's stopping you. So do you, do you feel like they're pretty open to faith-based comics? Um, or is that a, a struggle for you to, to get your foot in the door? Yeah, it, it's weird, man. It's like, I'm very happy with christianbook.com. So there we I sold them 74 copies of the sword of Eden. Uh, like I said, they sold out. So I'm very appreciative of that. It, it's, I had some comic book stores that just were not interested in the sword of Eden. Mm. Uh, I had some Christian stores that were not interested in the sword of Eden. So it's kind of like hit or miss. And the thing with mm. a lot of comic book retailers is that, you know, yeah, I think a lot of them are struggling now. They, they're still relying on Marvel and DC and some of the big publishers. I don't think they're that uh, friendly to indie comic book creators. Some are, like the ones I mentioned, and a, a bunch of other, others I've dealt with. There was one Christian bookstore. It's one of the largest Christian bookstores in the country, which I probably shouldn't name the name of that store. So I was talking to them. So I sent them a copy of The Sword of Eden. They said they enjoyed reading it but they didn't want to sell it because they thought that their readers would grumble, uh, you know, if they bought the book. And my attitude was like, if you like it, then maybe your readers might like it as well. <laughs> so they thought that some of the artwork is too, they were, how do they phrase it? Um, they thought that the readers would grumble when they read it and they were concerned about some of the graphics. So I'm not quite sure exactly what that meant. Mm-hmm. So um, the sort of eat is, is not Veggie Tales. Again, it's pre, it's for recommended for preteens and older. And yeah. I've had moms with eight year old kids. I had grandmoms with eight year old kids saying that their eight year olds loved it, you know. And I had uh, Christian readers that love manga, you know, love the Sword of Eden as well. So you know, you never know. So, but I I don't think I've had anybody complain about the book. You know, I you know, so everything so far is going well. So yeah, getting getting the books book in, into bookstores, yeah, I mean that's a bit of a challenge sometimes. So, very cool. Well, what do you think the biggest struggle is for a independent Christian comic book creator like yourself? Um, well, I think it's actually a wonderful opportunity now, since you know, the Marvel comics and the DC comics are not selling as well, but there are a lot of indie guys out there doing creator own work that, you know, they are doing crowdfunding. They're selling directly to the readers and they're doing it. They're doing well, they're doing fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's a great uh, opportunity for indie guys to, you know, do their own own comics and, and sell them directly to readers or through retailers and, 
and that. I think the big problem really is in regards to comic books, you know, the, the direct market is, is a problem because when I was growing up, you could find comic books in grocery stores and drug stores. Mm -hmm. They were all over the place. Oh yeah. I, in the seventies, I bought most of my comic books at the gas station. <laughs> Absolutely. So most people who um, don't read comics, like they just kind of forgot about them. Mm -hmm. So I think, so what was happening with the newsstand sales and those sales that those sales were declining. So that's when the direct market started where these uh, comic book stores, and we get, we have to thank Phil Schilling for this. Um, he got the idea of selling comic books directly to these comic book stores on a non-returnable basis. So Phil Schilling was working with Marvel and DC and, you know, uh, was working with the publishers and getting the comics into those, uh, especially comic book stores. And that's how the direct market started and actually saved comics. But now the direct market is not doing very well because mm -hmm. it's the only thing we have now. So I am very supportive of comic book stores. I'm very supportive of, um, you know, bookstores and Christian bookstores. I, what I told Phil Boyle was that uh, one of the things I said was that retailers are not our enemy. Our readers are not the enemy. So we need to work with them, you know, if we want mm -hmm. to see. You know, comics thrive. If, in my opinion, if Marvel and DC, if they crash and burn, it's their own fault. And I don't think they think they're doing anything wrong. I think Marvel and DC are doing exactly what they want to do. And the sales aren't there. And I don't think they care. I don't think there's any point. I don't think there's any point, need, reason to try to save Marvel or DC. Except for the fact that retailers have, have to stop relying on Marvel and DC. Uh, it, though, you know, back in the day, those folks would, you know, be profitable, profitable for retailers, but they're not now. So hmm. retailers are selling other stuff. They're selling toys, they're sell selling hmm. game stuff. Um, those pop head things, you know, Funko pops, whatever they're called, yep. you know, they're, and which is fine. You know, you know, if that keeps a retailer in business, I think that's great. But as far as, you know, the monthly comic book stuff, yeah. Uh, working with other creators, I think, you know, is a real, really good option, you know? I think Very cool. An opportunity for creator own uh, work and, and independent creators. Well, if somebody wants to keep up with you, Al, and uh, you know, find out what you're doing right now, maybe purchase your comics. Where can they go to find you? Where can they go to uh, to purchase? Uh, you can go to thesortofeden.com. So it's my website, and there are links to eBay and Amazon and uh, my online store. I also have, um, looks like I froze a little bit there. Um, <laughs> I also have links from, on my website to Facebook and other social media that I have. So sales on eBay and, and uh, my online store has free shipping. I couldn't find, figure out a way to have free shipping available on Amazon. But a lot of people like Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, and if you are selling a book, Amazon's great. Um, so... Yeah, go to the sort of .com. You can order the book through PayPal, you know, uh, through eBay, through Amazon, the online store. Um, you can send me a check. I mean, that'll work too. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, you got to do all these kinds, all these different uh, avenues. And there are links to my social media page, my YouTube channel, which I don't post a lot of videos, but I do have a YouTube channel out there. I have a, a little um, motion comic of the sort of Eden on YouTube. So people can check out that as well. Awesome. Well, I will put links down to a bunch of that stuff down in the show notes below. And uh, Al, it has been great getting to know you today. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Ricky, thank you so much for the invitation. I really do appreciate it. It was great getting to know Al. If you'd like to follow Al or grab a copy of his book, check out the links down in the show notes below. Well, that's all I have for you today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, click, you know, just click all those links down there. That way you'll be informed anytime we put out new content. You can find all of our social links and links to our YouTube channel and our online store at ChristianNerdUnite.com. 
If you enjoy the show and want to help even more, consider becoming a partner on Patreon. All of our Patreon levels have great benefits and make a huge difference in the ministry we're able to do. Speaking of, uh, over the next few weeks, I'm going to start giving you a little more information about some of those ministries that I work with. I'm working with ministries around the world who are finding seekers digitally and meeting them face to face. If you're interested in that kind of thing, let me know. Um, but the partner with us or to just check it out, go to patreon.com slash Christian Nerd Unite or Christian and click support in the menu. And don't forget to check out Christian Nerd HQ.com for even more great podcasts. Before you go, I do want to leave you with this blessing from 1 Thessalonians 5. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. We'll see you next week. Blessings. Hey.